Hello, everyone. Welcome to ACS Michigan's Supreme Court Term Review. We have a distinguished set of guests with us, and we're going to jump in in just a moment. But I wanted to thank everyone for coming and remind everyone to support ACS, whether it's your local chapter, uh, local lawyer chapter, or your student chapter. Please make sure you have uh, joined us for the year and uh, send your email in to the national folks so that you're on our lists. And with that, we're here today with Professors Bagenstos, Exum, and McQuaid. Professor Bagenstos and McQuaid are both from the University of Michigan, Professor Exum from the University of Detroit Mercy, and we have Dan Karabkin, who's legal director of the ACLU here in Michigan. We're gonna talk about some of the big cases that came out of the Supreme Court's coronavirus term, sort of a, a, different, um, a different end to the term this year, and some changes to the way oral arguments happened. But uh, at the end, we still got the range of controversial and um, insightful opinions. So we're gonna dive into that. A little bit of housekeeping for everyone. We're gonna get some commentary from our panelists first. And if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Those questions come in, we'll ask them as time permits. And, um, and please don't hesitate. Uh, this is meant to be a conversation as much as we can do it over Zoom. So with that, I'd like to start with um, the, the biggest of the controversial cases this term, which in my view is the June medical case. And I'd like to ask Professor Bagasos a few questions about that. But before we do, Professor Bagasos, can you tell us about June medical? What was this case? How did it get to the court and what happened? Yeah, I mean, so just very briefly, uh, so this was a case involving a challenge to a Louisiana law that uh, required people providing abortions in the state to have admitting privileges at a hospital within 30 miles of where they're providing abortions. And uh, it is a law that in that respect was identical to a law that the Supreme Court uh, had struck down in Texas in the Whole Women's Health case a few years back. Whole Women's Health was a very controversial case at the end of Justice, uh, at Justice Kennedy's time on the court where Justice Kennedy joining the four liberals uh, voted to strike down this Texas law restricting abortion. It was the first time since Planned Parenthood v. Casey that he had voted to strike down an abortion restriction. Every time since Casey, he had voted to uphold the restriction. But the conclusion was that this Texas law imposed such a burden on, on women who were seeking abortions that if Casey provided any protection at all, this had to be struck down. Um, what was notable about this case, there's a lot that's notable, but I, I only want to talk very briefly because I know you have questions. Um, what was notable about this case was um, in Whole Women's Health, the Texas case from a few years back, uh, Chief Justice Roberts had written a very sharp dissent. He had written a really aggressive dissent um, saying that the court was misapplying the Casey case, that in fact there wasn't an undue burden. Um, Justice Thomas wrote a very sharp dissent as well, saying, in fact, we should abandon all of the protection of abortion uh, in the Constitution, restating a longstanding position. When June Medical came to the Supreme Court, um, what, what was notable was that the district court had struck down the Louisiana law after a six day bench trial saying that this is basically the same thing as whole women's health. Uh, the Fifth Circuit, uh, bolstered by a bunch of right wing Trump appointees, uh, set, reversed and said, no, actually, this law is constitutional. Um, we shouldn't at least preliminarily enjoin it before it goes into effect. When the case went to the Supreme Court, it was a real test of Chief Justice Roberts in particular. Now we have a conservative majority on the court, a clear conservative majority. Justice Kennedy is gone, replaced by Justice Gorsuch. No question Justice Gorsuch is going to vote to invalidate, uh, is going to vote to uphold abortion restrictions. Uh, Justice Scalia, of course, uh, I'm sorry, Justice Scalia is gone, replaced by Justice Gorsuch. Justice, Justice Kennedy is gone, replaced by Justice Kavanaugh. Again, no question he's going to vote 
to uphold abortion restrictions. So all eyes were on the chief justice who liked to claim that he follows balls and strikes. He calls balls and strikes. And what we have is a case that is materially indistinguishable, it looks like, from a case recently decided, but a case that was decided by a 5-4 vote in which Roberts himself wrote a very hot dissent. And of course, as you say, Matt, on the hottest possible of issues before the Supreme Court. And so what Roberts does is he makes five to invalidate the Louisiana abortion restriction, but he doesn't join the plurality opinion written by Justice Breyer and joined by the other three more liberal justices. Instead, he writes separately to say he's only doing this because of stare decisis. This case is materially indistinguishable from the whole women's health case, but he throws a lot of language in his opinion suggesting he still doesn't like Casey. He notes very pregnantly, I would say, um, pun intended, that, uh, that, that the continuing validity of Casey was not challenged by any of the parties in the case. He has lots of language in his opinion about how stare decisis isn't an inexorable command and in fact is very flexible, but he just says this is such a recent precedent and nothing has happened to undermine its status as precedent and this case is so close to that other case that he has to vote to he has to vote to invalidate this abortion restriction, even though we know he's a very anti-abortion person. The other four conservative justices vote the way you would expect to in, to to uphold this restriction. So, it's well, can not. Can I ask you a question please. there about the stare yeah. decisis piece? Because Justice Robert Justice Roberts' concurrence is to me difficult to decipher. It looks like he's changing the law as he's saying stare decisis means we don't change the law. Because as I read the whole women's health case, we had this cost benefit analysis that ought to be applied when states enact these unnecessary regulations. And what Justice Roberts seems to say is, well, that doesn't remain anymore. We stick with this Casey test. And he seems to say that because we don't want the appearance of political change at the court to sway the law. But isn't that exactly what happened here? Yeah, I mean, you know, so so absolutely, it's really notable. And and something similar happened in Casey, by the way, right? It's really notable that, that Ju Chief Justice Roberts relies so heavily on this idea of stare decisis, we have to follow precedent. Um, but as the dissenting justices really excoriate him for, um, he changes the precedent that he purports to be following. Um, so, so in Whole Women's Health, what the court, in an opinion written by Breyer, said was, well, look, the undue burden test out of Casey, undue burden necessarily requires us to weigh the extent of the burden on a woman's right to choose against whatever interests are being served, right? I mean, how can you decide whether something's undue without trying to figure out, well, what it's, what it's trying to achieve and, and is it too much to achieve that? very common sense position. And what the court said in, in, in Whole Women's Health was, look, this admitting privileges requirement, it actually doesn't serve health interests probably at all, and certainly not to any significant extent to justify the burden. The dissenters, including Chief Justice Roberts, said that's not what undue burden has ever meant before. Undue burden before just meant a substantial obstacle to a woman's, uh, to a woman's exercise of her right to choose, and in his concurrence in June Medical, Robert said, look, I'm following whole women's health, but even though I dissented from it because of this language about, uh, b uh, about weighing the cost versus the benefits, I don't today read whole women's health as weighing the cost versus the benefits. If you squint really hard, you can see whole women's health as actually just applying the undue burden test of the past. Now, notably, Breyer, and the three justices who join him applies the balancing test from whole women's health in the June medical plurality. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's very weird. And it's just like Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which where you have this incredible, you know, poem written to honor stare decisis. Stare decisis is the most important thing ever, which is why we have to uphold the, the central holding of Roe. Oh, and by the way, we're overruling every case we decided between Roe and today. We're overruling Akron. We're overruling Danforth. We're overruling all these cases, right? So 
it, it's very similar in the sense of stare decisis feels like it's more a way of responding to political pressure of not seeming too political rather than actually in principle, we're gonna follow all our precedents. Well, then last question here, Professor, on uh, June Medical. A couple, maybe it's a year or so back, I heard you talk about the consequences of the uh, right to choose as a result of uh, the Trump appointees to the Supreme Court. And um, you said that, you know, Casey's in trouble. And that was a summary, a, a rough, a very rough summary of your comments. And I'm wondering, is, is Roberts's concurrence exactly as you thought, or is Casey going to survive with 999 cuts? Right. I mean, I think that is really the question, and I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, what, you know, what I would say is the, the court, ha, you know, I think it's very clear that Chief Justice Roberts is not going to vote to invalidate any restriction on the right to choose other than one that's been specifically invalidated by the court in the past and, 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 and under the Casey regime. And so what, what that basically means is this kind of admitting privileges law, um, certain kinds of targeted regulation of abortion providers laws like the one in Whole Women's Health um, and a spousal notification rule, um, that's it. Right. Uh, and so best case scenario for the right to choose is it gets whittled down to essentially that. But again, Roberts left a lot of language in his opinion that gives him the opportunity to say, you know, actually, Casey was decided in 1992. And ever since Casey, there have been all these developments that have undermined that precedent, that have made it unsound in principle and unworkable in practice, that have made it an island unto itself in the law, sort of all the standard ways in which uh, the court justifies overruling precedent. He's given himself that opportunity, and I think only time's going to tell whether it was just, it was too soon and too obvious it, it, that a change in the personnel of the court had changed the law for him to really look himself in the mirror and say, I'm a judge, not a politician, or whether he's just going to go with this death by a thousand cut strategy. But I really think those are the only two options. Well, that'll, that'll give us uh, plenty more terms, it sounds like, of controversy on this issue. Uh, with, with that, Professor, I'd like to shift gears to an entirely different area of law but uh, one that is equally politically fraught at the moment. And to talk about it, I'd like to bring in Professor McQuaid. Professor McQuaid, um, at the end of the term, really at the end of the term, we heard argument and then got decision in three cases involving the president's tax records. Two of these cases come out of the House, the, the House of Representatives. Another case comes out of the, I believe it's the Manhattan DA, or is it, is it the Bronx? I'm, I'm forgetting there, Manhattan. Uh, and so, Professor McQuaid, tell us about these uh, Vance and Mazers cases and, um, and tell us why it is that uh, these tax records are even at issue here. Oh, I, think you're, I think you might be muted there, Professor. I, I apologize. I don't apologize. I thank you. Um, it's, um, it's important, I think, to separate out um, the cases into two uh, categories. First was the case, as you mentioned, um, involving uh, a, a subpoena issued out of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office by Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance. So I'll call that one the Vance case, the Vance subpoena case. The other was three different committees of the House of Representatives that issued subpoenas for President Trump pursuant to their lawmaking, legislative authority under the Constitution. Uh, and the different committees had different purposes that they needed these records to explore various things that they were investigating for purposes of considering legislation. Um, so I'll call that one the House, the House cases. But in the Vance case, the Manhattan District Attorney case, um, a subpoena was issued to President Trump's accounting firm, Mazars, asking for, uh, I think, eight years of financial records, including his tax returns. And President Trump challenged that uh, subpoena in federal court saying that he had absolute immunity. A sitting president has absolute immunity from being investigated for a crime while he is sitting as president. He said it would be too distracting, it would subject him to harassment, um, and it would be too stigmatizing to a president to be investigated for a crime. 
Um, and the court rejected that uh, argument and said, in 9-0, they had a unanimous uh, consensus on this point, that a president is not absolutely immune from investigation and from subpoena power um, while he is a sitting president. And so that was a really important part of that decision. Um, there were two dissenters, Justice Thomas and Alito, on a second part of it, which is whether the president uh, should enjoy the benefit of a heightened standard, that there should be heightened scrutiny when the president is involved. Um, but the majority rejected that. Interestingly, there's a little gossip in um, this CNN series of reports today um, uh, by Joan Biskupic, who has been getting all this inside scoop about the most recent term, that originally this was a 5-4 decision and that uh, Justice Roberts worked very hard to try to get more consensus, got the 9-0 on the absolute immunity issue um, and had the uh, dissent only as to this issue of heightened standards. So um, people may be interested in reading that, that entire series about the term, but I thought it was particularly interesting about that case. All right, um, then there is the House cases, which is a, a different issue there. The House um, in its oversight uh, function, I suppose, which is uh, based on its legislative authority under the Constitution, uh, subpoenaed a number of different records. Uh, also, some went to this Mazar's accounting firm, others went to banks um, seeking President Trump's financial records and tax return. And in this instance, um, the president didn't claim absolute immunity, but says this cannot be part of the legislative function of, uh, of Congress. This is clearly um, investigating him. And if they want to do that, they have to invoke their um, impeachment authority to do that. And since they just said that this is legislative authority, they don't have the power to do that. Uh, that uh, argument was also rejected, but in this instance, the court did come down, the majority of the court did come down um, on this idea that a heightened st standard is required, um, that before the president needs to comply, you have to meet a four-part test um, that says it's not unduly burdensome, that you really truly need this information before the president has to turn it over, it's not for the purpose of harassment. And so, um, in this instance, I thought it was interesting that it demonstrated that a majority, including Justice Roberts, who wrote both opinions, were far more suspect of Congress than they were of a prosecutor in having some political improper purpose um, in demanding these records. So I'll stop there and let you ask. That, that was my question to you, um, Professor. And this is in part, I know that your background is U.S. attorney. So this this, this informs this question here. I, I wondered if you thought the, the court got the heightened standard piece kind of mixed up. Don't, do you ever see a scenario, sort of a hypo, hypothetical here, where a, a red state attorney general or prosecutor could go after a blue state democratic president and, and engage in the sort of harassment that I know it's difficult to take this president's legal filings at face value sometimes, but is, is there really a point here that, you know, there might be a state prosecutor who wants to harass a president for political gain? And, you know, did the court miss that? I, I don't know. And it, it, it struck me as um, odd that they would hold each of these to different standards. Now, certainly they're performing different functions, and there is precedent to suggest uh, to support the proposition that um, uh, you know, a grand jury is entitled to every man's evidence. That's, that's the quote from the law. And there's long-standing precedent for that. In the congressional arena, though, Justice Roberts repeatedly points out that there is not any case law on this because Congress and the executive branch have in the past worked this out through what's known as the negotiation and accommodation process. In fact, he mentions it so many times as to suggest that he's kind of scolding them for not working it out in this instance. And so, um, but in the end, despite the, the lack of precedent, I don't know why you wouldn't then look um, by analogy to what has happened in the criminal context um, and, and to, to have the same kind of trust for Congress that you have there or vice versa. The different standard to me is a little bit surprising. And even the heightened standard strikes me as imposing things, you know, this four part test is really no different than the same kinds of questions that any uh, judge would be considering when deciding whether a subpoena is overly broad. You know, um, is the, the legislative purpose 
uh, valid? Is it no more broad than reasonably necessary? Does it advance a legislative purpose? Um, is there an un undue burden on the president? Um, and anything else that the court ought to consider? Um, I don't know that they needed to articulate this heightened standard um, that's really any different from what a court looks at when a party challenges a subpoena with a motion to quash. But I do think it, it suggests that there is a heightened skepticism about Congress that's different from the skepticism they have for prosecutors. And it may simply be the bias that judges have for uh, normal uh, parties to courtroom proceedings where the standards are a little higher than some of what we see um, in, in Congress. If you watched any bit of William Barr's testimony before the House Judiciary Committee the other day, uh, you can see that it, it can get very political, very feisty, um, and it does not have the kind of decorum that you still see in courtrooms. Well, another point, another question uh, off of that point, uh, Professor, I was, I was re reading the, the consolidated case out of the congressional committees. One thing that I always thought was true, and I, I just assumed this was law, that Congress, when they issue subpoenas, they say that they're not covered or they're not bound by the common law privileges, like attorney-client privilege. And I, I read a part of the opinion that I think holds with, with uh, seven votes that um, you can claim attorney-client privilege now when, when Congress sends a subpoena your way. Is that, do I read that correctly? Um, and, and do you think that feeds into what you're talking about? They're really trying to limit what Congress can get a, a hold on here. Yeah, um, I do think it, it suggests that privilege is something that could be reviewed for these purposes. Um, it, and, you know, common law privileges, I think, are, are typically respected in most forums. So that didn't strike me as um, maybe a shocking uh, change in the law. Maybe others disagree with me. Uh, but preserving those privileges, I think, um, is one of the things that will um, allow President Trump to run out the clock here. Um, I think in both of these cases, uh, the court has suggested that he has the ability to um, invoke com any common law privilege that he might have, and attorney-client privilege would be one of them. And so um, I think that although these decisions have come down in July, uh, I think we're going to see further litigation. Already, President Trump has filed a brief just this Monday in the Vance case, the grand jury subpoena case, um, invoking um, uh, un undue burden and overbreadth as a way to continue to litigate. So I don't think we're going to see any of these resolved before the election. So there's the, you know, the short term win for President Trump, uh, even though in the long term, it, it seems that at least some of these documents will re be required to be turned over. Okay. Well, then we'll have uh, there too. There'll be more for the fall as we follow up on, uh, right. on what comes out of these. And, and with that, again, I'd like to shift back to civil um, and I think touch on another, another third rail, really, of American uh, political life right now that the court had to wade into this term. And uh, to do so, I, we have Dan Karabkin from ACLU. Uh, Dan, we had a couple of cases this term that dealt with religious discrimination. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. The... Um, uh, the ways that uh, Title VII may intersect with laws protecting um, religious liberty. And, uh, and to talk about those, Dan, I guess to start us out, there's um, a, a series of cases. Can you give us the factual and, and legal holdings that come out of the cases uh, dealing with the Title VII and religious liberty issue? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Bostock versus Clayton County, uh, was actually three cases about whether firing someone because they are gay or transgender violates Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and I, I was privileged to be on the litigation team for one of the cases uh, representing Amy Stevens, a transgender woman uh, from here in Michigan who was fired from a funeral home uh, for being transgender. Um, and the other cases involved two gay men who had been fired for their sexual orientation. Now, Title VII says it's illegal to fire someone because of their sex. Um, and I will tell you that when the Supreme Court took these cases, most people thought we were going to lose. Most people thought we were going to lose because most people don't think that sex and uh, LGBT 
are the same thing. Um, and most people uh, don't think that when Congress passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, they had LGBT uh, discrimination protections in mind uh, when they said it would be illegal to fire someone because of sex. Um, but what we did is we took a look at who makes up the court, a very conservative bunch, and the argument was really an appeal to what we call textualism. You just look at the plain text of the statute and you let the chips fall where they may. And so what we said was because of sex means if you were a different sex, you wouldn't have been fired, right? So what, what does that mean in this case? Well, uh, you know, if, if someone comes to your uh, holiday office party and says, you know, my, my name is Jim and I'd like to uh, introduce you to my husband, Bob, um, but, a same, but, this, but a very similar employee had come to the party and said, my name is Diane, and I'd like to introduce you to my husband, Bob. And Jim was fired and Diane wasn't. The reason is because of Jim's sex. If Jim had been a woman introducing folks to his husband, Bob, wouldn't have been fired. Same with the transgender discrimination case, right? So a transgender person, uh, uh, says that they were identified as uh, or set, assigned the sex of male, for example, which is Amy Stevens's case. She was assigned the sex of male when she was born, uh, but now she, uh, she presents and lives her life as, as a woman. Well, if, if, this, if, a, if, if another employee um, who also presents and lives her life as a woman had been assigned a female sex at birth, right, so not transgender, uh, she would not have been fired. And so Amy was fired because of her sex. That's all we said. We really didn't get into, you know, the civil rights movement involving uh, sexual orientation and transgender people or the right to marriage. We didn't get into any of that. So we took a very conservative approach just based on the text of the statute, and we won. Justice Gorsuch, joined by Chief Justice Roberts and the liberals by a six to three vote, said, that's right, we're gonna let the chips fall where they may. This is discrimination based on sex. It's true that Congress almost certainly didn't have this specific scenario in mind when they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But you know, our great hero, Justice Scalia, wrote a whole book where he says that doesn't matter. And so we're not gonna let it matter here. Um, and so it was a really positive development. It was not the most uh, culturally progressive opinion I've ever read but it was what we needed to get the job done and a really, really solid uh, win for LGBT rights. So I have two follow-ups here. One is, is a, bit, a bit wonky and the other is substantive. So let, let's start with the wonky one. When I, when I went to law school and learned about statutory interpretation and, and learned about you know, the structure of our government, separation of powers, the, the powers of Congress, I never imagined I'd read a case where a judge told me to throw all that out, throw all the you know, legislative history, throw all of the, um, the understandings that Congress had, take out your high school grammar book and start figuring out the sentence structure. That, you know, that's your law. And, and that seemed to be what Justice Gorsuch's statutory interpretation analysis was. Is that, you know, do you wonder what's lost, I suppose, by, you know, a, such an anemic statutory interpretation? Yep, in about 95% of the cases, I really worry about what's lost. Um, but, you know, uh, we, I often, we often criticize uh, judges and justices who say that they are t originalists or textualists until, until that's not their policy position anymore, and then they somehow suddenly forget about those positions. Um, uh, and and I, I have no insight into Justice Gorsuch's mind or the Chief Justice's either, um, but they took the intellectually honest path for them in this case, um, and they ruled based on the text. Now, the four liberals, or I, I mean, whatever, the four, who, whatever they are, who are not, cons not super conservative, uh, you know, they, they didn't write a concurrence. And so we don't, you know, they, they were happy to go along with this textualist position without looking at legislative history and that kind of thing. Uh, but we know that they, they are, you know, that is not their judicial philosophy. 
Um, but there was a decision made, I, it seems here, um, that there would be a single six justice opinion uh, that formed a coalition around um, uh, uh, you know, protecting uh, LGBT folks uh, under the because of sex scenario, just based on the text. Well, my second question here is a segue into uh, the, other, the other case that touches upon this issue this term. And I, I wanna ask you just how, just how substantive is this protection that the court gave, um, that the court gave here? And I'm, I'm, I'm asking you that because it sounded that, that it looked like this term, the court permitted religious groups to, um, to get pretty broad exemption, exemptions to federal law. So uh, I'm wondering if you could answer that question by segueing into the other, the other case on this issue. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, the, very interesting, when this case was originally litigated in the lower courts, um, at least with the Amy Stevens case, not, I don't think with the others, but with the Amy Stevens case, the, the, uh, the employer said, well, I'm, I, it's against my religion to, uh, um, uh, to employ someone who's transgender. Um, and interestingly, he only discovered that um, uh, in the middle of the case, but, but whatever, you know, he says it's against his religion. And, and, uh, and that actually was a successful defense in the lower courts. Um, but when the case rose to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, the employer actually decided to abandon that defense. They wanted to go just for the textualist um, uh, uh, fight over whether because of sex included transgender uh, folks. So, so we, not, we didn't get an answer to the question of whether there is a, um, a religious defense to um, Title VII uh, when you're being uh, accused of firing someone because they're uh, uh, because of their sexual orientation or or right. because they're transgender, so that is a that is a future uh, thing for us all to worry about, and we could only we can only celebrate for so long because that's certainly coming down the pike. Um, did you want me to talk about the uh, um, uh, the uh, Espinoza decision as well, or should we save that for another? Can we save that for another time, Dan? I think that one's going to be its own uh, its own event here in the fall, if that's okay. Sure, good. Okay, um, that leaves us back with another set of criminal cases out of the court this term. And to help us walk through those, we have Professor Exum. Professor, this is an uh, you, you've got sort of a a mishmash here of cases that come from different parts of the Bill of Rights. Can you talk to us about these criminal cases this term and um, again, facts and holding to begin? Sure, yeah, I mean, they, they cover crim pro, so criminal procedure and also criminal law. And so they seem a little disjointed, but um, really at the heart of all of them is a question of how we want this interaction with the criminal justice system to be, like how do we actually want to achieve justice in our criminal justice system? So there's, there's this underlying just real people concern um, and I know we're, we're, you know, short on time, but I just have to say, um, cause it oh, just no, reminds we me, we have okay, yes. well then I'll take my time yes. to make this point, um, that we're having this event at the same time as, um, representative John Lewis's funeral. So hopefully folks who are on this call are, are recording that, um, I caught a little bit of it and I'm recording the rest and it's just really a beautiful display of a person's life who was really focused on everyday people and their experiences and this fight for justice. And so I tried to keep that in mind um, as I was, that just kept coming to mind as I was looking through these cases. So I just wanted to make that point. So um, I'll start with Kansas v. Glover. That case, it's a, uh, a case dealing with the Fourth Amendment. So I'm um, dealing with this issue of our protection against unreasonable searches and seizures, but specifically about car stops. And so when you're thinking about the everyday people, especially in this moment, um, where cars have become, become sort of this gateway for officers to begin their interactions with individuals, um, which as we know, of course, in this moment, the country is very, very much focused on this idea of um, the dire consequences that can, that can come from police interactions and abuse of power in those, in those um, situations. So I was disappointed by the outcome of this case. Um, what, it, what happened in the case is that there was a routine traffic patrol, a routine patrol, and a Kansas um, deputy sheriff ran a license plate check on a pickup truck. This truck was not 
observed doing anything illegal, no traffic infractions. The um, patrol officer just ran the plates, found out that the truck had been registered or was registered to Glover, who um, the search also revealed he had had his license revoked. And so the question was, does that give enough reasonable suspicion um, to stop the vehicle, which would be a Fourth Amendment seizure, right? Um, the, the justices all focused on really what reasonable suspicion means, how certain you have to be, with the majority ultimately holding that this was fine, as long as there was nothing negating the officer's inference that the, the owner of the vehicle would be the driver of the vehicle, then go ahead and make the stop. Um, the dissenters, so Thomas wrote the opinion, the dissenters, we have um, Justice Ginsburg, um, I'm sorry, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan and Justice Ginsburg wrote a, a concurrence, but Justice Sotomayor pointing out that um, that maybe it's not reasonable that lots of people drive other people's cars. And especially if you know that the driver has a, re the registered owner has a revoked license, that maybe your inference should be that this person won't be driving because they're not allowed to be driving. And that's what the whole discussion was about. You know, what, what, um, what's reasonable suspicion in this instance? Um, what disappointed me about the case was that there was not this focus on the actual individual. And so when we're thinking about the Fourth Amendment protecting an individual from an unreasonable search or seizure, here what I prefer to imagine is a person legitimately driving a vehicle, this vehicle, you know, not, um, not breaking any traffic laws, right? So there's no reason to arouse suspicion there, that um, the vehicle is also legally registered. So this isn't running the plates and finding a vehicle that's registration is expired, nothing like that. Um, it's just, you know, I, I'm driving in this car, but it happens to be registered to someone who isn't supposed to be driving. And now this opens the door for officers to suspect me without anything further. The officer didn't have to drive past the window to see does this person look like they could be Charles Glover. Um, so it was nothing about the individual, but instead about the car. And it just gives another open door to officers to begin interactions. Um, of course, we get the case on the back of Charles Glover, who did in fact have a revoked license, who shouldn't have been driving, but that's what all criminal procedure cases are. We get the facts of the person who was caught doing the bad thing, um, but let's not forget all of the people who um, also can be stopped under this view of reasonable suspicion, who are doing nothing wrong, and now they have this open interaction, open door to interaction with police officers that um, we hope goes well for them, but as, as we know at this moment, um, we've turned our attention to seeing that that is not always the case. So that's the, um, the Glover case. Did you want me to just roll through the others also? I do have a couple of questions for each case, but if you wanted to continue rolling through, it's, it's fascinating to listen to you. So please, yeah, roll yeah, on. Great. Well, thank you. So um, Collar versus Kansas, this is a, a little bit of a different shift because it really is criminal law. Um, but again, we're thinking about your everyday person and what justice really requires. Right, so in this case, it's about Kansas and um, whether or not, or their treatment of mental illness as a defense to criminal law liability, whether that was, um, was appropriate or whether it violated due process. And so um, quick primer, I guess, is necessary. Um, in criminal law, you know, you have to satisfy the elements of the offense. And um, even if you satisfy those elements, so let's just use murder, I killed someone and I meant to do it. Right, so I satisfy um, some level of intentional murder, intentional homicide here, but I might still get a defense if I'm excused or justified. So maybe I'm justified because yes, I meant to kill this person and I did kill them, but I did it in self-defense. Or maybe I'm excused because yes, I meant to kill this person, I did kill this person, but I suffer from a mental illness that affected my moral blameworthiness, right? Um, and so most jurisdictions have some form of an insanity test that um, looks at moral culpability. So did you actually understand right from wrong? Um, did you understand? It also might, might deal with your actual um, cognitive capacity. Did you understand even what you were doing? And what Kansas did is that um, it basically removed that true defense and instead said that mental illness would only come into play if it negates culpability. So because of your mental illness, you didn't actually mean to do what you did. So you didn't mean to kill that person. Um, or it can come into play at the sentencing phase. So if you did mean to kill the person, um, then the question is, 
once you're convicted at sentencing, will we diminish, will we mitigate your punishment based on your, um, your mental illness? So in this particular case, the defendant um, killed four family members. It was a pretty, um, pretty gruesome case. Um, he was charged with capital murder. He wanted to raise an insanity defense. But his defense was going to be that due to his mental illness, he um, could not distinguish between right and wrong. So this is really going to his uh, moral culpability. This was not allowed under Kansas law because he in fact knew what he was doing. He knew that he was killing, he meant to be killing. He just didn't know that it was, it was wrong. Um, that, at least that was gonna be his argument. So he was convicted. Um, mental illness, he was allowed to raise it at the sentencing phase, he did so but um, the jury uh, sentenced him to death. So um, even though it was raised, it was just raised as another sentencing element, they weighed you know, that against everything else, found that there were more aggravating factors and sentenced him to death. The Supreme Court in this case said that due process does not require Kansas to adopt an insanity test that turns on whether a defendant can recognize that something is um, morally wrong. And the the whole discussion um, on both sides in this case went down to um, a recognition of history um, that of the sort of this common law understanding of the insanity defense and what it means to be um, held liable under criminal law and that moral culpability is extremely important. Where the justices differed here was um, whether it was okay that Kansas took it into account as an element of an offense and at sentencing. And ultimately the majority, um, Justice Kagan wrote the, um, wrote the opinion. The majority said, this is fine. Mental illness is considered in some way um, in the Kansas scheme. And even though it doesn't give a full defense, that is still, um, it's still appropriate. Um, we had Justice Breyer uh, filing a dissent with Ginsburg and Sotomayor joining, basically bringing up the point that um, what Kansas did was allow for someone who, who could possibly be morally blameless to still suffer criminal liability. Um, and so it's really this discussion about what is the whole point of criminal liability, right? If you're morally blameworthy, shouldn't you be excused? Um, and that bringing it up at sentencing just isn't enough. And of course, in the case of this particular defendant, he does raise it at sentencing and he's still, um, he's still sentenced to death because the sentencing phase is entirely different from um, the trial phase and um, has different rules, different burdens of proof, everything is different. And so, um, so I agree with the dissent that it's just not um, enough of a protection here, but it gets to that issue of, you know, what do we really think justice requires? Um, and so then I'll go on to the last one, the um, Ramos versus Louisiana. Um, so my, I'm from Louisiana, my hometown. So um, I like to say, you know, this is, this is true of the abortion case as well. I like to say, you know, Louisiana, we're pushing law in the right direction based on our bad choices. Um, so, you know, um, so that this is another one. So here's finally one where I'm happy with the outcome of the case, um, although Louisiana is the bad actor here. This case is specifically um, about juries and um, unanimous or non, allowing for non-unanimous jury decisions for convictions. In, um, in 48 states and in the federal system, you need a unanimous jury in order to convict someone um, of, a, of a serious offense. And two states, Louisiana and Oregon, allow for convictions based on a 10 to two, or at least allowed for convictions based on a 10 to two verdict. Um, interesting thing in this case is that every single justice across, you know, across um, uh, the spectrum agreed that um, history supports unanimous juries, that when they look at the, the history of the Sixth Amendment, when they look at um, going back uh, 400 years, they say, that this is what was understood about juries and that, that um, the Sixth Amendment's um, protection of an impartial jury has to mean more than just that, that it has some real true substance to it. Um, and that a unanimous jury is a requirement that, um, that was contemplated and was understood forever. And it wasn't until um, 1972 in, um, in some cases out of Louisiana and Oregon that the Supreme Court took what, what the majority called a strange turn and upheld this non-unanimous jury um, allowance, but it was based on, um, it was based not, it was based on a series of fractured opinions. So it wasn't the situation where um, basically when you're counting up all the opinions, they're all 
they're all over the place. And all you had really was one justice, Justice Powell, who, um, who was holding it together for, for allowing for non <laughs> Sam, <laughs> Sam's having, <laughs> having a problem with wasps, um, who allowed for non, non-unanimous juries, but his whole point was not that he believed that non-unanimous juries were okay, but that he, he had a different view of incorporation. So this ends up being a fight about incorporation when everybody agrees that the Sixth Amendment requires, um, or at least at the, at the time, the 72 case was about incorporation when everybody agreed that the Sixth Amendment required unanimous juries. In the Ramos case, the whole issue really was about um, stare decisis. And that's where the split was. And again, all agreeing that the Sixth Amendment requires unanimous juries. And so it just turned out that enough justices were okay with overturning the, the case from 72, um, then weren't. So finally got it right, but based on stare decisis, or based on being okay with, with overturning this, um, this previous case. It was surprising to see um, a starry, such, a, such a striking stare decisis split in uh, in a criminal in a criminal case like this here, and in some ways, I think that the Ramos case, as you've as you've told us, gives us the biggest structural change to the system, and probably gives uh, opportunities for for the litigation for thousands of people in uh, in Louisiana and, and maybe Oregon. I, I don't know the dates um, offhand, but I I did want to ask you a question about um, collar, because I I thought that was the big philosophical case, the big philosophical criminal case. And, and do you think there's, do you think there's value to the, the Kagan opinion when Justice Kagan says, she, she kind of, I thought, hinted at this. What if you had um, a pro-life individual who started um, violently attacking abortion doctors, abortion providers? And in theory, they could raise this. If the due process requires um, the insanity defense that Mr. Collar wished to raise, couldn't they too benefit from it? Yeah, well, just remember that um, when it comes to the insanity defense, even though, so you can't make the argument solely that you believe what you were doing was right, right? Um, But that it has to be linked to a mental illness. So some sort of mental illness that um, even though this sounds very scientific, it really ends up being a jury decision. So does the jury believe that your your view of right and wrong that is out of line with with sort of the reasonable juror's view, right? Because we're talking about something that is out of line with what we would normally hold people morally responsible for. So it's out of line with that. Do you believe that that's due to a mental illness? So the thought about of people um, reacting in a, in a violent way against others, um, committing crimes against others because it goes with their, you know, their moral views really is, is, a, is separate from um, dealing with people who are acting on um, the product of true mental illnesses that can be explained in a way that says because of this mental illness, they have a disconnect between the view of right and wrong, not a political view, not a purely moral view, um, but instead a, a view that really is disconnected from what we, from other folks who don't suffer from this mental illness um, would have. Okay, thank you, Professor. And uh, with that, we've, we've covered, um, really, it's just a sliver of the court's cases this term, but most of the hot button issues. And I'd like to turn to some thematic uh, questions for you. And, and they dovetail with some um, of our audience questions that have come in. I'd like to talk a little bit, and this is for anyone, um, talk a little bit about sort of the judicial independence that, that becomes, and, and the political influence on the judges that becomes such a focus of media coverage. And um, through that lens, here's the question from our audience. Can we expect, quote, liberal Chief Justice Roberts in a non-election year? So let me try to answer that before I have to duck away from the wasps that have invaded my my home office, um, which I'm sorry about, very bad timing. Um, So I think it's very unlikely we're going to see liberal Chief Justice Roberts in a non-election year. I do think there are you know, opportunities like Dan talked about to use the kind of conservative jujitsu arguments on, on, on these justices. Um, And, and I, you know, I I think that the plain meaning will work in some of these cases. Plain meaning is very manipulable. I think 
in general, though, what drives this term is very much, look, it was incredibly controversial the way that Justice Scalia's seat was held open um, so that President Obama could not fill it. And the idea that they would immediately go on to start issuing a bunch of socially conservative rulings right after that, particularly in an election year, and a bunch of rulings that seemed to favor the Trump administration in an election year, um, I think that was too much. I think Chief Justice Roberts is a very politically savvy person. He understands exactly how his institution gets perceived, and he does not want his institution to be perceived as just part of the conservative political movement. Um, it's, there's an irony because I think he is being very politically astute in trying to present himself as above politics. He's very good at it. I guess I'll just add that um, as this CNN series uh, makes abundantly clear, uh, Chief Justice Roberts is very much concerned about the institutional legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Um, so willing that, um, as we saw in the June medical case, willing to uh, sacrifice what he thought was um, the wrong outcome if it were in a vacuum, um, to further advance the institutional goal of stare decisis. Um, I, I think he, uh, you know, he, he presided over the impeachment trial. Um, we have, I, I know that our society has been polarized before and that we've seen politics creep into everything before, but it just seems like at least in my lifetime, it is uh, so tribal, much more than I've ever seen, uh, that I think he's working hard to maintain the perception of the court being above the political fray. And it requires some political savvy to do that. And so um, I, I think that that uh, CNN article where he worked really hard to try to get the court to 9-0 on absolute, uh, rejecting absolute immunity, for example, um, is really important to maintaining um, the perception of an independent court. Um, and, and so, uh, that doesn't mean he isn't trying to move the court to the right. I think he, but he understands he's playing the long game and he'll do it in a very incremental way. And so even in the June medical opinion, he sort of telegraphed to the parties, don't bring me the exact same case we've already rejected before. I'm going to reject it again because of stare decisis. But hint, hint, bring me a different case. Bring me something where the, I can distinguish the facts and we might be able to move the abortion um, argument uh, a little more to the right, but we're not going to get there in one step. It might take multiple steps to get there. So uh, I, I don't think he's, you know, turned liberal. I think that he is going to insist on moving the court to the right in baby steps to preserve its uh, institutional legitimacy. And I want, oh, Dan, did you want to jump in there? No, I mean, I, I, I think I, you know, just Chief Justice Roberts is about 65, I think. He's got 15 or 20 years to accomplish what he wants to do. And so I don't think um, he has to do it all. He knows he doesn't have to do it all this year. So I think that's what we were seeing. Well, then I, I have another question here that uh, comes out of the, the audience uh, with us. And it's pretty straightforward. Who is the leak for the CNN series? How are they getting this information? Uh, a bit, a bit of a, a tongue-in-cheek question there, but um, I, I do have I do have an issue uh, to discuss with all of you that comes um, that comes up again, which is a, a number of our of our uh, um, listeners, I guess I don't know what you call Zoom attendees, but um, what are the power dynamics at work here? Do you see? Do you see it? Did I, it may have been some information loss. What are the power dynamics this term? that you see maybe shaping future decisions? I'll, I'll jump in, although I don't know that I have a great answer, but just, just thinking, I mean, to me, I think a lot of people looking at this term had some surprises, right? Um, but that's perhaps the clue into what's going on, which is that, I mean, and I think the, um, I think the, the um, sex discrimination cases were like brilliant. Um, so Dan, kudos to you and, and everyone who worked on that. But that really gives that insight, right? Which is 
um, that they're kind of, you can move the needle ahead with this court if things are framed in this very precise way that allows it to be done still under this, um, this, I guess, I don't know the best way to call it, but this like blanket of conservative, you know, um, values still. That there's a willingness to, to you know, take up, to take decisions, um, to take arguments and to move forward with them, but they have to, they have to be presented in a way that allows that. And I'm thinking about this, um, this Ramos case um, so the, the jury one, again, where you have Roberts, again, you know, saying, look, stare decisis, right? It just so happened that he didn't have enough folks on his side um, to hold this one up, but he was very much concerned. And I mean, the language, even in this case, he says, or in his opinion, in his, in his dissent, um, he says, uh, stare decisis gets, the doctrine of stare decisis gets rough treatment in today's decision, right? And he goes on to say, like, it, it was like it pained him, <laughs> you know? Um, and it just turned out, um, I think in that case in particular, especially, there was a lot of discussion about the racist history underlying the non-unanimous juries. And so that really got a lot of momentum. But those are the, the things, it's like, you know, you can move this conservative court forward in progressive ways if you just give them the opening for it because i think there's this willingness what that says about power and all that i'm, I'm not sure i'm answering the question but it at least is unveiling strategy well with that as much as um as much as we barely scratched the surface we are at 1 p.m and that is our stated end time so i'd like to thank our panelists all of you have been just wonderful to listen to and supporters of acs and uh, really leading lights in the progressive community here in Michigan. So thank you and, um, and be well, and hopefully we have in-person events very soon. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks, Thanks, you, everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you for tuning in today. And please remember to send some love to your ACS chapter. Hopefully, again, we get to see you soon. Bye now. <laughs>